invite you at this time to turn in your copies of the Bible to the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts. Find the beginning of the New Testament. There's the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then following the book of John is, is Acts. We started a, a series here last week uh, at Redeeming Grace uh, on the book of Acts. Our hope, Lord willing, is to, to go through at least the opening chapters uh, before the Advent Christmas season. Uh, we introduced it uh, last week by looking at the first five verses uh, of chapter one and then turning to the very last few verses of the book of Acts uh, to see uh, that the gospel goes out unhindered. And that's really the message of the book of Acts. And we want to dig into that a little more as we look at this idea of the kingdom of God today. Uh, so to do that, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 11 of Acts chapter 1. Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. Hear God's word to us this morning. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the, the apostles whom he had chosen... He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when, they heard, uh, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven." Stop our reading here. The grass withers and flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Let's take a moment to pray and ask for his blessing on this time together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you for your kingdom. Lord, and as we have read these verses, as we hope to consider them this morning, we know we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to be at work uh, amongst us, to be present with us, uh, to be taking these words and applying them to our hearts, opening us up to receive what you have for us. So Lord, would you do just that? Uh, would you guide my words as I speak? Would they be from you? Would you give us all ears to hear, hearts to receive, uh, to see Jesus lifted up uh, and to bow down before him as the king of all things? And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever been in a relationship of any kind with anyone, uh, you've probably learned that communication is a pretty key element to any friendship, uh, dating relationship, marriage, whatever it might be. And communication is so important to pay attention to because misunderstandings happen so easy. Right, kids, you can think of uh, maybe your parents give you uh, a certain instruction uh, put your clothes away, uh, for example. And by that they mean, do the full job, put your clothes away in your dresser or in your closet. And do you think putting them away means stack them on your bed and walk away? Or maybe sweep the floor and you sweep everything into a nice neat pile and forget to actually sweep it into a dustpan and throw all the food crumbs in the garbage. 
right? There's misunderstandings, there's miscommunications. These are just a few funny examples, but it, it can get deeper and more tragic uh, depending on the relationship, depend on, depending on what's being communicated. And one of those instances is really here in this passage. As we opened uh, the book of Acts last week, we noted that Jesus is with his disciples. He's teaching his disciples. He's sending his disciples. And yet they have a big misunderstanding about what Jesus' mission is and about what the mission he has for them is. And that's what we want to consider this morning as we we look at uh, the verses that we read. We're going to see a problem we're going to see the actual answer to that problem and then what it means for our lives. So three points that you can see projected behind me as well. That there's a, a question of the kingdom. The disciples have a question about the kingdom. Secondly, that Jesus teaches them then about the power of the kingdom as he seeks to redirect their thinking, to, to correct their misunderstandings. And then lastly, that there's application for the kingdom. This means something for how they live, for how we live today. First of all, the, the question of the kingdom. Their question, the question of the disciples really comes in verse 6. Uh, as I mo- mentioned a moment ago earlier in Acts, we read that Jesus uh, is appearing to his disciples after he uh, was resurrected from the dead and before he ascended. Uh, there's a 40-day period where Jesus is with his disciples. He's, he's teaching them. He's training them. He's equipping them. In many ways. And verse 3 mentions that one of those things that he taught them about was the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus spent 40 days uh, proving his his resurrection and also teaching them about what this means in terms of the kingdom of God. And yet they still don't get it. Uh, They still misunderstand what Jesus means by this. And and, and that's revealed In their question, it's somewhat humorous. One commentator notes that there's as many errors in the disciples' question as there are words uh, that make up the question. And we see that if if we pull their question apart for for a minute. They ask, at this time, Jesus, at this time, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? First of all, we have to acknowledge that there's something good about asking this question. They're seeking God's rule. They're seeking Jesus' reign over all things. But first of all, they, they, they mix up the time. You see, in their minds, uh, they, they've walked with Jesus. Jesus has taught them. Uh, he's sadly died, which caused them much grief. But then much to their joy, he appears to them again. And they're thinking, this is it. Now, now is when uh, Jesus is going to reign. He's going to take over all things, and, and we're going to be his servants. Now is the time which also betrays another error that they had about the kingdom. And that is that they had in mind a physical kingdom. Specifically, the term restored uh, uh, gives us a way. We don't know what was going on in their their minds and in their hearts as they were thinking through uh, what Jesus meant by the kingdom. But maybe their minds went back to the Old Testament stories. They, they, They thought of the glory days of the kingdom of Israel where David was king. And he had united all the tribes of Israel into one nation. Uh, And and they were defeating enemies. No one was taking them over. They were, uh, it it was the glory days of the kingdom of Israel. Perhaps they're thinking, now is the time where that's going to be restored. And besides that that fact, Old Testament prophets had had prophesied about a, a coming king who would sit on the throne of David. We can think of Isaiah chapter 11, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah Uh, who said that there would be a shoot that would come up from the stump of Jesse and would bring in this glorious eternal kingdom. Maybe they thought this was the time that that was actually fully going to take place. Or perhaps they were thinking uh, of the promise that God had made to David in 2 Samuel 7, uh, where God comes to David and says, I'm going to make you a great house. I'm going to make sure that there's always a king who sits on your throne. A descendant will always reign on the throne of David. And they're thinking, now is the time. There's going to be a physical kingdom in Jerusalem once again. There's going to be a physical throne. Jesus is going to reign. We're going to have peace. Which betrays the last error that they made. And that's specifically in the last words of their question. They are thinking 
of an immediate physical kingdom restored to Israel. You see, the disciples had in mind that that Jesus is the king of the Jews. The the kingdom was always about Israel in their minds. And now that Jesus has has come back to them, now that he's he's talking about this kingdom, he's going to come, he's going to reign, Israel's going to be on the map again, they're going to drive out the Roman oppressors, everything's going to be good for Israel once again. They're God's people, God is going to be pleased with them, Jesus is going to be reigning But these are three strikes against the disciples as they misunderstand, misinterpret what Jesus is actually saying. Even after he teaches them for 40 days and is with them and demonstrates his power, demonstrates or or teaches them about the kingdom of God, they still are missing the point. And we'll get to his correction in a moment, but this is something that we need to be attentive to as well as we think about our place in the story of Acts, our place in, in God's world today, our, our place in the kingdom of God. We mentioned a few errors last week, and it's worth noting the temptation that the, these, these draw because they're always there. We can go back in history a little ways, a couple hundred years, and there was a movement that was called the social gospel. That, that was all about uh, the, the fact that we needed to bring in God's kingdom as we, we care for the poor, as we lift the poor out of poverty, as those who are, are oppressed uh, uh, are, are raised up out of that condition, uh, given a better place, better standing in society. Once these things physically happen, then the kingdom of God is going to come to earth. Now we have to admire many things about that. In fact, the Bible calls us to, to care for the poor and the oppressed. God is a God for the poor and oppressed that we read about. But it misses the point in that that it makes the kingdom of God a a totally physical thing. And there's movements in our day that that, that focus so exclusively on on certain social issues that the gospel is lost in the middle of that. One thing that came to mind is uh, the Christian environmental movement where there's so much focus that's put on, on creation care and creation stewardship, which again is a good thing, but can be focused on so much. That the message of Jesus, the message of salvation, is lost in the middle of that. You could think through history in, in other ways as well. And it can be a temptation today as well to, to have a top-down uh, Christian ruling over, over all things. You can think of in the Middle Ages as well, times of forced conversion. Where Christian rulers w- would force people at the edge of the sword to become Christians. Or the, the, the idea of a, a physical, territorial expansion of, of Christendom, that this Christian uh, rule over things uh, that the Crusades promoted. All of these are things that, that miss the point of what Jesus is actually saying, what Jesus is actually teaching his disciples, what he's teaching us in this passage. And that's where we need to turn to Jesus' words to see how he redirects Uh, The disciples thinking as we consider the power of the kingdom. Our second point, the power of the kingdom. If you look at verse 7, it's interesting Jesus doesn't directly answer this question. Or doesn't directly answer the question in the way that we might want or that likely the disciples wanted. If you look at verse 7, he begins speaking by saying, by telling them it's not for them to know about times and seasons. It's not for them to know God's timing uh, for these things. God has his plans. God has his secret purposes. God has his, his timing, but, but they weren't, it wasn't their concern to know these things because there was something else that they needed to be concerned with. And that's where Jesus redirects their thinking, where he redirects our thinking and focuses in on what, what's really core, what's essential to the kingdom of God as he's teaching it about it in this place, in, in this passage. And there's a couple of ways that he redirects the disciples and our attention to this in this passage. First of all, Jesus draws an essential link uh, between the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God. We see that as Jesus uh, continues in verse 8. He tells his disciples that they will receive power from on high, the power of of the Holy Spirit. This 
reinforces what, what we read up in Acts 1 verse 3 where, where Jesus says that not many days from now uh, the Holy Spirit will, will be poured out, that, that they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting that Luke, Luke ends his gospel in the same way with Jesus telling the, the disciples that they're to wait in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power from on high. Why is this significant? What's this link between the Spirit and the kingdom? As we said, Jesus is reorientating his disciples to the very nature, the very essence of the kingdom of God. What he's having them see is the kingdom of God is not ultimately physical. It's not about a throne and a kingdom and an earthly kingdom being set up in Jerusalem. It's a spiritual kingdom. And it's a kingdom that's furthered, that's expanded uh, through the Holy Spirit. Which is why Jesus then calls his disciples to be witnesses. What Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God is built. The kingdom of God expands. The kingdom of God crosses the earth as, as his Holy Spirit filled disciples go out in the power of the Spirit. Bearing witness to what Jesus has done. Testifying of the finished work uh, that Jesus has done in his death and resurrection. Their message is, is not about physical power and physical might in, in a kingdom like that, but about surrender. Surrender to Jesus Christ. Surrender to the one who died to forgive sins. Who died and then through his spirit makes people brand new. Changes people from the inside out. Changes their allegiance to, to live for them and for the world and for the devil to living for the things that please God. That give God glory. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is about the rule and reign of God in the hearts of people. As that message of salvation is brought. And as people come to see Jesus Christ as Lord and King over all things. And as he says this, Jesus blows apart categories that the disciples, that the Jews of the day would have had in their mind because he tells them about the scope of this kingdom, uh, the, the scope that, that they're going to be empowered uh, to bring this message of the kingdom into. He tells them to stay at Jeru in Jerusalem, first of all. That's the starting point. The, the, their, their mission, this witness, the kingdom begins in Jerusalem, and then it goes out into Judea. Now, that would be all fine and good for the disciples. But then things get dicey. Because Jesus then says you're to go to Samaria. A region of people that the Jews absolutely hated. And beyond that, to the ends of the earth, to the lands of the Gentiles, to the lands of these people who are unclean outside the promises of God, outside of the kingdom of God. Kids, you can picture it this way. If you've ever thrown a rock into water... You see the ripples that slowly move out from the center, right? That's what Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like. That's what Jesus is saying that the work and the witness of the disciples is to be like. It's going to start in Jerusalem, but it's going to end, go to the ends of the earth. Here's what Jesus means by this. The kingdom of God is for all. The kingdom of God is is for all people. It's, it's not a national kingdom. It's not a, a kingdom that's exclusive uh, to Jews in the land of Israel, but it's a kingdom that's to be offered to all people, that's to go around, be, be, be preached around the world, that's open to all, no matter their ethnic identity, no matter their background, no matter their past history, no matter their family upbringing. The message of the gospel, the message of, of Jesus as Savior, as Lord of all things, is for all people. And that's the message that we bring out today. That's the message that Jesus is also commissioning us with. To go out beyond these walls. And to bring that message of salvation in him to any, regardless of who they are. Regardless of their background. Regardless what condition they're in now. But to declare that. Jesus is Lord, that he is the Lord who binds up and heals, that he is the Lord who rules over all. And this is really 
what the Old Testament was pointing to. We go all the way back to, to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, uh, verse 3. Jesus, or, or God comes to Abraham and, and blesses him, makes promises to him, saying that all the nations in, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Jesus is, is declaring that that promise is about to be filled as the gospel goes out to the ends of the earth. Or in the prophecy of Isaiah, once again, in Isaiah 49, verse 6, as God is speaking about the servant of the Lord, the servant who's going, going to do his work, he says, I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. You see, what Jesus is saying as he redirects the, uh, his disciples' focus onto what the kingdom of, uh, of God actually is, Jesus is saying this was always God's plan. This is what the kingdom of God was about. It was about every tribe, every nation, every language bowing before King Jesus, coming before him, recognizing Jesus as Savior, recognizing Jesus as Lord. And now the disciples are to go out and declare that to all that they meet as they're empowered by the Spirit as they go. But there's something else here as well, another empowering factor now that more evidence of the power of the kingdom, and that is that Jesus ascends. It's that Jesus ascends, verse 10 and 11, to Luke records here the account of Jesus going, to, going up. Kids, imagine this for a minute. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes where you've walked and talked with Jesus for another 40 days. You're talking with him right now. He's giving you these instructions, and all of a sudden he starts to go up and up and up just starts floating. And then a, a bright cloud covers him. And you're gazing there, wondering what's going on, amazed at this. That's what the disciples were feeling. We read that they, they, they gazed up, they gazed intently, they were staring up, wondering what was happening, wondering what was going on. Now this passage is about more than just what the disciples were thinking and feeling at the moment, because the, the, the fact that Jesus ascends, the fact that this happens, is important for the message that Jesus gave just before he ascended. Because on the one hand, Jesus had to leave in order for the Holy Spirit to be sent out. He told his disciples that. If you look back in John 16, uh, as Jesus is teaching about the coming of the Spirit, as he's teaching about the fact uh, that he's going to lead them, he says, it's good that I'm leaving you. Because then I can send the helper. Then I can send this power from on high uh, to be with you, to help you. I mean, think of it this way. There's also a parallel uh, back to an Old Testament story about someone else who ascended. Kids, any stabs at that? Who went, just went up into heaven in the Old Testament? Yeah. Jesus did in the New Testament. We're thinking in the Old Testament. Kirk? Enoch was taken up. I'm thinking of someone else, though. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Elijah. Elijah. Right? Do you remember the story, kids, where Elijah, he was a, a prophet uh, in the land of Israel, and, and he got uh, a helper named Elisha. And then God told Elijah that his ministry was ending, so, so they crossed the river, and, and God said that he was going to take Elijah up into heaven. And he did, right? The, this, this chariot from heaven that came down and he took, uh, Elijah was taken up into heaven. But Elijah and Elisha have an interesting conversation before that, where Elijah asks Elisha, what can I do for you yet? Well, what's a request you have from me? And Elisha responds by saying, let me have a double portion of your spirit. In other words, let me be equipped with the same spirit and more uh, to do the work that I'm now taking on from you. This is why, this is really foreshadowing Jesus' ascension, and it shows why Jesus' ascension is so important. Theologians call Jesus' ascension into heaven part of his exaltation. Part of the fact that Jesus, or, or part of uh, Jesus' process in becoming king. He ascended up into heaven and he was seated at the right hand of God. 
This comes across throughout the book of Acts as Luke frequently refers to Jesus as Lord. The Lord who empowers his disciples. The Lord who rules over all things. You see, Jesus, by ascending, is Lord over all. He's, he's Lord over the nations. His ascension shows that Jesus is living, that he's reigning, and that because he's, he's alive, because he's reigning over all things, the disciples has, have hope even as they, they carry out the task Jesus had given them. We have hope and encouragement as we carry out the task Jesus has given us. Here's why. As the disciples started in Jerusalem, as they went to Judea, as they went to Samaria, as they went to the ends of the earth, they were going into territory that Jesus already ruled. They were going into to, to lands and to regions and to places where Jesus was already king. Where Jesus was already Lord. Jesus is, is Lord over all. He, he's Lord of the nations. And, and they went in with the message, with, with the call for people already living in those places to submit to Jesus as king. To turn to him as their Lord and Savior. You see, the ascension isn't an afterthought. It's not one last detail that's tacked on to Jesus' ministry because the apostles felt like they had to write some extra history. It's something that's key to who Jesus is today. It's something that's key to the mission that he has for us as well. Because this gives us hope. That as we go into whatever a sphere God has us in, as we live our lives for his glory, as we, we reach out to, to neighbors and coworkers and wherever that might be, we're going where Jesus already is. We're going where Jesus already reigns. We're going with the hope that he is in charge. That he is already at work. Leads us to consider our third point, the application of the kingdom. The application of the kingdom. There's a number of ways that we can think of, of how the kingdom applies or, or how we apply this message of the kingdom to our lives. And the first is that there's a call to come into that kingdom. There's a call uh, to come into that kingdom by faith. You see, the message that the disciples brought, the message that, that we bring, that we call people to, is to come in faith to Jesus and so be welcomed in to that kingdom. As we said, the kingdom's for all. The doors have been swung open for all who will to, to place their faith in Christ, to receive him, to become part of God's family. And it's not something that's achieved by good behavior. It's not something that's merited uh, by religious activities or, or saying the right words or doing the right things. There's not a citizenship test to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no rites of passage. In fact, actually the opposite is true. We enter the kingdom of heaven by recognizing we have nothing to bring. We enter uh, the kingdom of heaven by recognizing that we can't earn God's favor. We can't earn his love. We rely completely on his grace. We enter the kingdom of God by recognizing that there's nothing in, that we, in our hands that we can bring. We simply need to cling to the cross of Jesus. We enter the kingdom. You enter the kingdom by believing that this Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago for your sins. That he, he was raised to new life three days later to give you new life. That he ascended into heaven uh, to reign over all things. And the call of the gospel is this. That the moment that you place your faith in this Jesus, the moment you recognize that you can't bring anything to earn God's love, to earn his favor, to earn a place in this kingdom, the moment you recognize that and place all your trust, all your confidence in Jesus, he makes you a citizen of that kingdom. He, he welcomes you in because your sins are forgiven by his death. 
His blood washes away all your sins. He took the guilty verdict in your place so that you can be declared innocent and perfect before God. That's yours by faith in him. Faith that as we look at the resurrection, that because Jesus rose again, you can have new spiritual life. He can make you a brand new person. And so the call to, to each and every one of us is to trust in this Jesus today. Not to lean on ourselves, not to lean on the wisdom of the world, not to lean on the self-help philosophies that are out there, but to recognize that it's in Jesus that we have life and life to the full. That the kingdom of Jesus is the best place to be. Surrendering ourselves to him is the safest place that he can be because he's good, because he rules over all, because he gave himself to save us. And as it makes us, as the gospel makes us new people, it transforms the way we live. As we live as, as recreated people by the Spirit of God, it affects everything that we do. It means wherever we go, uh, wherever we live, whatever, wherever place we find ourselves in, we go as those who have been redeemed, as those who have been made new, as those who, in a sense, then bring the kingdom of God with us. Because Jesus is ruling and reigning in our hearts. And so as you go to work, you go to work and interact with your coworkers, interact with your boss, interact with clients, whatever it might be, as a recreated person. As someone who's been made brand new by the Holy Spirit. And so you work sacrificially, you, you, you serve to the best of your abilities, recognizing that you're not ultimately working for other people, you're working for God. You work caring for coworkers, caring for clients, caring for your boss, seeking the good of the company that you work for all so that God might be glorified. And, and in all of that, you are seeking that, that God would be glorified by those that you work with, by those that you interact with. Or in another realm, another sphere, so to speak, at home. Moms, as you interact with your kids, as you change dirty diapers, as you prepare food, as you do these seemingly basic, mundane tasks over and over again, you are bringing the kingdom of God into your household. As you go as a recreated person, someone made new by the Spirit of God, witnessing to your family, witnessing to your husband and your kids what it means to live sacrificially as Jesus did. And beyond that, you have a special role in equipping your kids to do the same, to recognize that they go out in, in whatever realm they are in, bringing the kingdom of God with them. Or husbands, as you, you, you witness to the kingdom of God, as you sacrificially love and serve your wife and your children, as you lead them before God in prayer and in family devotions, as you model, even outside the home, before your family, what it means to love and serve other people, to bear witness to what Jesus has done and what he's calling us to. Then on another level, we need to think about this as a church, how this idea of the kingdom applies to us as a church. One of the ways it applies is we come alongside each other, as we, we fellowship with each other, as we come together in small groups and, and, and help each other be the husbands and wives and parents and workers, co-workers, bosses, employees that bring the kingdom of God with us wherever we go. We do so as we care for one another, as we care for the neighborhood around us. The, spirit of, the kingdom of God is a, a spiritual kingdom, but it doesn't mean, that doesn't mean it doesn't have physical applications for how we physically care for one another, how we physically care for the needs of those in our community, recognizing that Jesus is Lord of all, recognizing that he is coming back. So the, the, the angels told the disciples, Jesus is coming back to redeem all things. And we go as those who bring a taste of that redemption to those we meet. A theologian named Herman Bovink summed this up really well. He said, the kingdom of God extends as far as Christianity itself. It exists wherever Christ rules, wherever he dwells with his spirit. This is what it means to bring the kingdom of God. 
We do that as we seek to love and to serve our communities, caring for needs while bringing the good news that Jesus reigns over all, that Jesus is Savior, that he is King. We do so as we go out as transformed people, seeking to be further transformed and seeking that, that the transforming spirit be poured out on those that we meet with. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we do thank you for your kingdom. We thank you that Jesus is Lord and King over all. We thank you that he has called us to, to be a part of this kingdom work as well, and we pray that we'd be diligent in doing that. Lord, we've talked about numerous ways uh, that we are to, to bring the kingdom with us. Lord, to recognize that, that Jesus is ruling and reigning our, in our hearts and to live and act and, and talk and, and share uh, because of that, out of that. So keep us faithful, Lord, as individuals. Lord, help us to do all that you call us to diligently, recognizing our need for you, recognizing our, our daily need for renewal at the feet of Jesus. Give us humility, Lord. Uh, give us a dependence on you. Show us our neediness. Show us that you are strong, that, that you equip us, that you strengthen us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand and we'll sing another song, number 404, from the Blue Psalter Hymnal. Thank you. 